Hello, beautiful, light-filled souls. My name is Trisha Barker, and I am so excited because today I'm here with a former student, John Michael Self, and I have wanted to talk with the students and share um, you know, this experience with someone who I've known for a time, and, and I love it when students tell me about their near-death experience because probably in all these many years, there's been like five or six of them, not very many, but you know, they usually do gravitate to me. So. I find your story fascinating because of where you were. <laughs> Do you mind setting the scene of the work you were doing and, and where you were in the world? Uh, Southern Afghanistan, uh, 2012. Uh, basically a month ago to the to the, to the day. Um, wow. Uh, March 23rd, I believe. I'm kind of foggy on the exact dates. Everybody has a different version of what exactly took place. <clears throat> and um, we, were, we were doing contract work over there. Uh, and what is contract work in Afghanistan like? So like, <laughs> tell me. It, it can run the gauntlet from serving meals in the dining facility to uh, the really, uh, the really uh, I wouldn't say ignorant people, but the people who don't know any better actually go outside the wire with guns and, and, and work by themselves. Uh, you don't know what you're getting into. You remember that conversation I had with you, you know, like, what did I just get into? Um, it was yeah. totally unlike that previous eight years I'd spent in my Iraq, uh, basically, you know, very safe. Yeah, so why was Iraq safe? Like, we just would, you know, like, I think the average person who hasn't been in the military or been a Marine, like, how is Iraq safe in comparison to Afghanistan? It was very structured. Uh, we, we went in in 2003, um, very, well, we had, I think we'd learned some more early lessons since the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and I drove a, a uh, Mercury um, Grand Marquis from Kuwait City up to what we call the CPA, so the Coalition Provisional Authorities, where uh, Bremer was the uh, ambassador. I, I drove that car up there all by myself, hmm. following a military convoy. Wow. Um, not many people get that opportunity, and further, few probably agree to do it if they <laughs> I was just out sitting in the hotel room waiting to go into to Iraq, so I volunteered. Interesting. Um, so it was very structured and felt like there was a lot of protection in Iraq and then Afghanistan was just a free-for-all? Like absolutely. Was, absolutely. Um, Though I've got friends that will say Iraq was much more dangerous than Afghanistan. Um, I didn't see that side of it. I did get shot at quite a bit in, in Iraq as far as when we were on the road. Uh, I went through a couple of IEDs. Um, one, of them, um, one of them was pretty bad. But um, one thing about being a contractor is if you get hurt, you go home. And I've never saw anybody bury someone come back and I just wanted to stay. So I didn't report it up. I remember I called my parents one time and, and they, it was probably the first time I'd ever been under fire. And uh, we had left Baghdad, or actually we had left Northern Iraq and going into Al-Assad, a little base called Al-Assad. On the way to Al-Assad, this was in early 2003, there was a little town called Fallujah. And it was before Fallujah was Fallujah and we got hit hard. Uh, took some casualties, but before we even got there, we had an IED. We were on the side of the road. I was like, man, this is really exciting, right? Most people would pack their stuff and go home. Uh, smart people would. I just kept doing it. And, uh, so when the IED went off, what is that like? Like, I mean, did you feel it inside? Was it, did you feel it? Oh, it was a little pressure. Um, it, had, it went off right in between my truck and the truck in front of us. Um, for some reason, we didn't get anything. We got a little bit of shrapnel, a little bit of, I uh, still got two scars, but. I mean, nothing of gaping wounds, nothing like you see, like some of those guys had. Um, it did take that one truck to flip it a couple of times, and then the guy had ejected the soldiers that were in for two soldiers, and they walked away from it. So it wasn't a massive ID, but it was enough to scare you. So fast forward to the moment when um, you were hurt and you had to go to the hospital. So can you set that scene? Yeah, I had gotten sick. Uh, I was home on leave on vacation. And uh, I had been drinking pretty heavily. Uh, my mom said I had a premonition. She says that I told her to take care of my family the day I left because I didn't think I was coming back. Well, I left. That was March 18th, March 23rd. Uh, my last memory. I, 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 it's just, it all goes together. And um, the one person that knows everything about it was is unfortunately uh, he's got a, he was in a very bad car wreck. And, um, his version of events. And then what I remember, they sometimes don't jive, and then they'll say, yeah, it did happen, or no, it didn't. 
and the basically the last thing I remember is the night before uh, we, we were ambushed, and I remember being behind the wheel well of the, of the vehicle. Uh, and this was on the way back from a party. We, we used to go partying on Thursday nights in Canada. Well, I know this is all time so partying in Afghanistan, so they had oh, nightclubs and they had. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, we stole some liquor uh, from from some of the, the local citizenry. And uh, there, this is the stuff that's going to be for posterity, and I don't like really talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you don't want to talk about something, you can not. <laughs> I'm smiling because I look back at it when you were just totally stupid, but um, we were we were rowdy, rough guys, and uh, yeah. and Thursday night we didn't work on Fridays, so Thursday nights were Friday nights, and, and everybody drank out of there, and it was basically bootleg liquor. I got to tell you this funny story: the first time I ever drank in Afghanistan, I was sitting there thinking it was like Iraq. We didn't drink in Iraq; it was very, very regulated. Uh, I'm sitting there in, in, the, in the compound. This is a nice compound owned by a very wealthy Afghan that we're working for. And all of a sudden, the bosses are out there. They start pulling. We're all wearing pistols and guns. And all of a sudden, the crowd roll bottles start coming out. And everybody's getting hammered. And I'm like, I'm in the right place. I like this job already. Next thing I know, we're out in the middle of Kabul, downtown. It's a club called Gandamak. And, and I don't know left and right. I mean, I don't know where I am, don't know how to get back. But I trust these guys. And what they don't tell me is that the booze that is actually in the Smirnoff bottles is not vodka, it's Afghan moonshine, it's laced with opium, all kind of. I lost my mind. I, I had four drinks and it was the worst thing I've ever had. Wow. Don't remember getting back. Don't remember. So that wow. kind of like, whoa. And, uh, but at, when, when we got to Kandahar, I was pretty scared. I remember calling my dad and said, dude, I, this, is, this is nuts. What they want me to do out here. Uh, and basically it was just uh, making trucks down convoys, but there was, uh, there were other contractors there, and we did some some anti-insurgency work uh, with one of my friends who, uh, I don't want to talk about that part, but um, it, it, it it required a release, and sometimes to go out, we would, we would get this one friend, and he was sort of like my mentor, uh, former Green Beret, uh, one of the best guys I know, I trust my life with him, I love him. Uh, I'm not gonna say more than my own family, but he's he's in that in that what's the, that level, right? Yeah. And uh, I would do anything for him, and he would do anything for me. And he he taught me how to stay alive out there. I just thought, yeah. So that sounds like it's dangerous, wild, this crazy place. And then there was you know, these nights of partying. So your before your accident, you started with. A bit of partying. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. then what happened? I remember we've been partying, and my friend Mike, he said, uh, we, we've got to take um, got to take this guy back to the base. So we looked off this base. We had no, we, we were out by ourselves. Mm -hmm. It was in an armed compound, and there was plenty of guns there. It wasn't like we were, you know, at, at risk for anything. Anybody that walked into that compound got what they deserved, but a um, bunch, of, bunch of tough guys, and I might include myself, but just a Tough guys in that compound. Um, we took this guy back, and sometimes over there you just get what I call your spotty senses. You know, you just know something's wrong. And, and we were going along this road, and it had these high berms on it. We couldn't see anything. I'm like, Mike, we're about to get hit. I just feel I know it. And, and he says, Yep. And he pulls off the road. It was, they were building a new road, and this was on a dirt road. And we go bouncing around, and like I said, I had bronchitis real bad. And I, I, I don't remember what happened. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what happened. I, I, I do remember being like hunkered down with my with my rifle behind the wheel wheel. Um, I remember an explosion, but there was like no bullets flying or anything like that. It wasn't wasn't uh, so? Like, was it an IED or was it? Yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, Mike says there was, and then sometimes he says there wasn't, and I honestly don't know. Um, there was um, there was a car bomb right in front of the facility in front of the compound where we lived. Uh, they told me that they found a guy's head like 600 feet away on a fence. So maybe it was yeah. Yeah, and then um, the Afghans started shooting, and there was just one checkpoint I was talking about earlier. Um, but everything kind of runs together, so I don't know what days were which, and I and I think there was a, a space of days that this happened throughout. My mom and dad probably know more about it than I do, and I, I just never. The only person that was there to tell the story is, is not able to tell the story. 
um, but you know that something happened in that moment, which might have been an IUD or some kind of bomb, and that affected you internally. Somehow. Yeah, I, I, that's what I believe because I, I was I'd been sick, and then I was fine. Yeah, I'd been sick a week before that, and I, I was back to work, and we were working out, and we were. And that's how I remember I was talking about the blocks work out and I was working out. We'd actually got new gym equipment the day before. Um, so this happened and then there's somewhat of a blackout. And did you have a, a period of time before you got to the hospital or what happened in that? Yeah, the best I can piece it together. I remember being in my room and something told me that something was, it was bad. And I do remember going and saying, hey, I need to go to the doctor. And I don't remember what happened after that. Evidently, they sent me back, according to my, my friend. Mm -hmm. And I guess the next night, both of my lungs collapsed. Mm -hmm. I had a pulmonary embolism. And but you didn't know this in the moment. You no, just knew this. You couldn't I just, breathe? Yeah, I couldn't breathe. Well, I, didn't, I, don't remember, I don't remember this part of it. Wow. Uh, this, next, this part comes next. My friend said that it was 200 yards from where I lived, to where he, to, from, from room to room, right? And it's over open ground. Somehow, and this is when I started believing in like higher power because I don't remember doing this. I put on my, my bulletproof vest or what we called our, our, um, our plates and I got my weapons and I crawled on two collapsed lungs with a pulmonary board or if that's even possible, whatever my lungs were done, I could not breathe. Wow. Or very little of me was breathing. Um, he said he heard scratching at the door and his door was kind of like had steps going into the room. And I had curled up on the side of the step so he couldn't see me. It was night time. And he said, he went back to bed. Oh. And he said, something was just bothering him. He heard scratching again. And he said, he went out and he looked down. And he goes, there wasn't a ball it's for the door. And he goes, I picked you up. And he's a big, big, big dude. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> he picked me up. And uh, I don't remember him getting me in the car. I don't remember anything. I remember going to this checkpoint again. And I don't know. I don't know what happened. That's the that's the hardest part of this. Is like I, I parts of me like okay. I know that I, I have flashbacks, not really flashbacks, but just like sparks of memory. And I understand that because even just with the wreck, I mean, you're in a dangerous place. You know, you have this military training, you're doing contract, but it's just danger all around. I just had a car wreck, and I don't remember every moment of the ambulance drive, you know, to the hospital. So it's I think it's trauma. You know, like when you're having something major that's happening in your body, you, you can't remember it all because things are slowing down and the world's moving really fast around you. So there's things that are happening that I, you're not picking up on. The most distinct memory I have of that is I remember him getting out and they were not going to let us pass. At night sometimes, I, I wouldn't say it was Taliban. A lot of people call them Taliban. They were just basically people taking advantage of the situation. I mean, very poor, economically depressed country. Um, people would, you know, if you wanted to pass, you had to give them a candy bar, ten dollars, something. Yeah. You know, uh, but they they would not let us get to the hospital. And I, all of us are all hell broke loose. And Mike was a guy that he had a lot of special forces training. Um, I remember I was in the seat, and I remember watching this like kind of like my eyes were barely open, and I was like so tired, I just wanted to go to sleep. And uh, I remember, okay, I got my, my head on pistol right here in my chest. Uh, I pulled my pistol out, and at that minute, I, I was like, that's it, I'm just going to die. Wow. Put it back, and I don't know. I don't and know where yeah. so, I, 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 We got to the hospital, evidently, and uh, Mike said that I was up and walking. Huh. And when we got to the hospital, we didn't like two guys showing up and out a bunch of machine guns on. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, they wouldn't let us in. Oh and, my and my friend Mike is, is not going to be persuaded to not do something he needs to do it. Somehow, some way, I don't know what happened, but he was talking to him and they said I collapsed, or he said I collapsed, and my heart stopped. And I know that this is accurate because having lived in Korea, like I couldn't go to a military base doctor, maybe I could go to a Korean doctor. So I know that even, you know, like if you're not exactly in the military, so if you're a contractor, if you're a civilian, it might not take right. it. And so was this an Iraqi nope. doctor? This nope. wasn't a military. This was a military base. Uh, but yeah. somewhere, I think there's another doctor that was involved, and he was uh, from Kosovo. Oh. And was an amazing man. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, I don't remember. I think, well, I do remember that he was a, a when I got sick, right? When I, 
Peyton was a doctor of treatment for bronchitis. He told me that I was in his hospital. I don't remember that. Huh. I, but Mike told me that we went to the military hospital. So, so the military, probably because you passed out like that, they, I don't know, I guess it's their duty, so they you know, took you yeah, out. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how, I, I'm really unsure of how I went from one to the other. I don't remember. Interesting. But I know that he was involved and he was a key component in saving my life. It, I, I remember the first time at the hospital that the, the military didn't want to help me. Um, and this doctor did, but it was a contractor hospital on that base. Does um, that make sense? Yeah. It was like a yeah. civilian hospital on the base yeah. uh, for the civilians on the base. So, and, and I'm sorry that it sounds so piecemeal because I, and I don't really think about it in, in terms of a pre NDE anymore. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because it's all just part of the trauma. Yeah, it's like that's not the important part. Right. Right. The, 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 the key important part of that is that. There was a guy that um, put his life on the line to save mine. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and I don't, I, I can't describe that kind of thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So they took you into the hospital, and then, do you think you had more than one near death experience? I think I did. Well, I think I, I think my heart stopped twice, but I had one in there. Okay. Interesting. So if your heart stopped, and when you had the near-death experience, did you see your body? I mean, did you come right out of form, or were you somewhere else? I did, and that's why, that's why I think that I had two. Um, my mom, my mom was very wise. She's very in tune to the spiritual world, and, and, and she's a good Christian lady, but if my mom has a good feeling, I tend to listen to it. And she says she thinks my ending happened in Afghanistan. I tend to think it happened in Dubai. I, because when I came out of my body, I was seeing the Dubai doctors. I had been in a coma, and I couldn't tell you what they looked like. I mean, I, I can. That's when I knew who I was dealing with. Okay, right? so yeah. Sense? So you looked up, and you actually saw the doctors. Mm -hmm. above you. Yeah, it's gonna sound terrible, but there was this one real feminine young doctor, probably one of the best doctors there. But um, I, my dad will remember it because when, when the day I got released out of the hospital. Remember how I told you that I wasn't ready to get out of the hospital, but I was going anyway? Right. I had to take my iPad to that doctor. And and my, cause my dad was like, I'm going to disown you if you walk out of the hospital. <laughs> and I was like, Dad, the doctor said I'm good to go. And I guess I had just bluffed him really good. <laughs> and they said, oh, yes, Mr. John's ready to go. <laughs> Didn't give me any trouble. <laughs> I think they were ready to get rid of me <laughs> at that point. So maybe your mom felt you dying, but you didn't have your near death experience of that moment. I don't think it was in Afghanistan. I think it was in Dubai. So you were transferred. You were treated in Afghanistan, and then you were taken to Dubai. Yeah. So um, there had been. It, it was a bad, a bad time of. Uh, uh, some other guys had gone to that facility, and I understand there were some that were in uh, another explosion. Not contractors, but military guys, and they. The way it works, I, I, I later learned, is that they will push out who can who has the best chance of surviving. And Interesting. They were trying. They try to evacuate everybody to higher levels of care in Germany. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to make that flight. Mm -hmm. uh, they were basically just keeping me sedated and keeping me. Uh, they said I had a tube in my chest. I don't know. So. What, um, so you were transferred to Dubai. Let's just get right to the near death experience. Oh, I want to tell this little part of the story okay. because yes. this is another part. Um, to, to take to give me transfer, the military was not going to transfer. Wow. They basically said it's, it's over with, right? Wow. And uh, my boss, the guy that, that I worked for, I said, I asked what, what was it going to take to get him out of there, and they said, uh, you're going to have to charter a jet ambulance. Have you ever charted the chart of a jet ambulance before? No, I mean, that's expensive. $60,000. $60,000, wow. <laughs> but yeah, just a, without insurance, a helicopter ride and along the coast in California. Uh, Talking about guys, I'm not going to say names, but I haven't seen him since that day. Well, I haven't seen him in six years now, but uh, he's still very near and dear to my heart. Um, just had twin daughters, beautiful family, everything going for him. He, I mean, he was his financial help to get me out of there. Oh. And if, uh, if for all the the hospital staff, my friend Mike, for all they did, his decision to do that saved my life. Wow. If he hadn't have put down his credit card. Wow. 
Wow. I don't know if I can do this for my own family. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds horrible, but I, I mean, I don't have it. But yeah, you know, yeah. he wow. did that and it saved my life. And, uh, so you were transported in the jet to Dubai and then. I distinctly remember, I think maybe I, I might have came out of my body inside the jet too, because I remember watching somebody work over me in the jet. Wow. Um, and it's how I knew I was in an airplane. Wow. Um, so were you in a coma or just simply stated at that point? I think I went into a coma and they kept me in one. I, okay. I'm not sure of the medical yeah. terminology. Uh, but I, I think if they hadn't kept me sedated, I probably would have been out of it anyway. And for those who are listening, um, what was it that was causing your lungs to collapse? So was it? They said it was a suspected pulmonary embolism. But that's not what you think it is. You think it was probably the bomb that. Yeah, but I just I can't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. And then and nobody else remembers it except Mike. And, Interesting. Um, I mean, it was just being you know, him and I rode a lot of lonely, dangerous miles together because mm -hmm. we tried to team up. Even though we were out there by ourselves, we tried to team up. He worked for a totally different company than I did. Um, we did basically the same job, he just did it for a different company, and that's kind of like a conflict of interest. But. So that's interesting that you had several out-of-body experiences, but the, the longer near-death experience occurred in Dubai. And yes. you said, how many, how many um, doctors were around you when you were looking at them? You saw the one? There, there was one and three nurses. And this this is what I remember. So I'll, I'll set the scene and try to take you from step one. Because this is the important part. Um, I was laying in the hospital bed and I could feel pain and I could hear people. So maybe I wasn't totally comatose. I don't know. Everybody calls it a coma. I don't, I don't, if you were, if a coma was any different, I would hate to be in it. Okay. Yeah. So you could hear things. And Absolutely. Wow. Um, couldn't talk. I couldn't move. Uh, and the absolute worst part of it was having to, I had oh, an awareness. All right, so I knew that I was soiling myself, and and you have know, heard about sponge baths by, by pretty nurses. They suck. I'm sorry. It's just <laughs> sponge baths in cold hospital rooms are terrible. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so uh, that was a disappointment. And then uh, um, I when I'm laying there and I'm just wanting to get out of this pain so bad. It was the most I've never ever been in pain like that. And, I don't, there's no level like, you know, the smiley face chart in the emergency room. Oh, yeah. That thing went out the window. Yeah. It was, <laughs> One to ten, it's it like was, 300. It was, kill me. Yeah. I'm ready to die that kind of thing. Um, there was this one doctor, and I never saw his face until I woke up. But whenever he would work on me, I knew everything was all right. This guy had his, whoever trained him, trained him well. He was, turns out he was an Iraq. And, and, uh, you know, the whole mentality, I mean, I had a 180 degree shift of what I had been, my perception of people at that point, but I'll, I'll regress. I do I, I also divert it somehow. So, there you are in the scene, most likely in a coma, and you lift up out of your body. Do you see the whole room and the doctors? And well, the I first heard this, people praying. Hmm. There was, it was like, I remember in the, when I was sedated or comatose, or you want to call it, I remember thinking, this is like that movie, Bruce Almighty. I remember thinking that. Mm -hmm. And it was like somebody hit a switch, and all of a sudden, all these prayers started flying. I heard people oh. 8,000 miles away amazing? In, in East Texas praying for me. Um, I heard my mom, I heard, uh, I heard my aunt, I heard a friend that, I mean, I really hadn't talked to this guy and his wife since high school. And um, I heard them praying. And, um, so it was like just an audible hearing that you could hear these prayers because when I felt them out of body, they felt like a wind coming through me. But you heard the exact words. Like I got like a whole like just it was like compressed, and I just felt uh, like, it was compressed. But yeah. it was I could make out words. I I don't know what they said so much as what the intent was. Yes. And, and there were many people that were given but only specified two or three. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's exactly the way it was for me. Like I heard my aunt, an older great aunt, very clearly. I heard my mom and dad, and then I heard others, and then I kind of knew who wasn't praying to, because everyone knew I was going into surgery at that point. So I knew, like I could feel love, and I could see who loved me. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you were feeling, you know, like who's really 
like frame a strong prayer and free. Yeah. Uh, and that's interesting. That'd be really, I mean, I know my mom, my God, I've, I've been, I, mean, I know we talk about, you know, contractor and war fighter and all this. Uh, I'm the biggest mama's boy you ever saw, right? My mom and my dad have um, gave, give, they provided a good life for me and I owe them a lot. But, um, you know, I, obviously they were great. I knew, I mean, if they weren't, something was going to be said <laughs> later on, right? <laughs> so you felt prayers, and, yeah. it, and you felt like it was a long period of time, like people were praying over different times, and you were hearing this, or it was just all one? Just one. Yeah. And it was, it started, the sequence of events sped up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I heard that, and I remember being very touched that my friend Chris and his wife Tammy were praying. Um, like I said, I hadn't talked to them in 20 years at that yeah. point. And, uh, and then you saw the room? Mm -hmm. No. I heard code blue, code blue. And I remember thinking somebody's in trouble. <laughs> Not you, but somebody. <laughs> well, I, and I can't remember if I heard code blue, but I started hearing this, this chant. Um, oh man, it gives me chill bumps even think about. It. When, I, when I used to tell my, my, my family this part of the story, I start crying because it was so unreal. I can't describe to you what this sounded like. Maybe you know, but it was this. Uh, almost chanting, sort of. All I knew was angels praying. That's what I knew. And it, but it wasn't like, you know, now I'll you down to pray for It wasn't that kind of praying. It was like, some serious, like next world kind of praying, right? Way above well, what we were capable of. So it was it, in a language you didn't hear or you didn't understand? I did not understand it. It was just beautiful. It was beautiful. Absolutely. Music beautiful. Or anything, or? Yeah, I would say it was music. It was. I've been to a Catholic church once yeah. when they were really, and that's what it sounded like mm -hmm. in that vein. And, and, and I, I'm not educated enough to, to put uh, terms to those descriptions, but and it had a holy quality to it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I knew like that's when I was like, uh oh, yeah. That was my uh -oh moment, right? Yeah. And then I heard Code Blue, or I heard Code Blue and heard that one of the two. I honestly don't remember, but the two did happen, and I'm just not sure what the sequence was. And um, I remember thinking, it, it must have, I must have heard the code blue first because I remember thinking somebody was in trouble and I didn't realize it was me. And then I heard the same. So I, I'll go with that version. And uh, mm -hmm. I, that's, that's kind of all I remember. And then um, I don't remember anybody working on me. But next thing I know, I, I, I've heard people talk about hitting the ceiling or something. I didn't do that. Next thing I know, I was like, oh, crap. And I'm on my side, and the stuff's coming out of my mouth, right? And you're seeing yourself, though. Yeah, I'm seeing this happen. You're seeing yourself on your side. And did you feel disconnected from that body? Or? Yeah, the pain stopped instantly. I was, yeah. I was more, I was intrigued from an educational standpoint. And I was like, this is interesting. Um, don't hurt like this. <laughs> see where this no goes. pain. And so far, I guess I had the job as what well. It had the jail as what was happening. And so you weren't aware that you were dead. You were just like disconnected from it. Yes. Yeah. But I remember I was I had all these tubes and uh, I was on my side and I was like, why do they have me on my side? And I saw this stuff coming out of my mouth. It was like dry blood. Hmm. It was very nasty. Uh, that, anyway, the nurse was uh, I mean I was I was concerned about getting her all very, very, very nasty. And um, I heard the doctor say, that's it, he's gone. And, and the nurse was like, no, no, no. I, they, I mean, these, these nurses that I had, I, I, I can't remember their faces really, but they were fighters. They were fighting for me more than I was fighting for me at this point. They were not giving up. And they didn't do CPR, but I can remember. So um, from what I understand, a friend of mine, his wife is a doctor, and she said, that, you, know, you can't do CPR with your side, but they flip you over like that when you're uh, what call, um, aspirating. So I don't know if they did CPR after that because I don't remember going back to a, you know, on my back position. But I remember hearing the doctor say, that's it, he's done. But it was an Indian accent. It's quite funny. I kind of got... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I kind of started laughing. And I thought, wait, this isn't enough. Not funny. And then all of a sudden, boom, I'm in this other dimension. And that's the only way I can speak of it. It's the other world. Um, it's, it's not cold. It's not hot. It's just there. There's gray fog um, about knee high. It's almost like a screensaver or something like that. Uh, and, I, and something just told me to walk. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm like, heck yeah, I've been laying on my back. You know, I feel good. You know, no pain. And um, I keep walking, and it seemed like forever. And I wasn't getting tired. And I knew it. I, I, I guess I had a concept of time that it wasn't forever, but it, it was a distance. And uh, I come up to this tree, this beautiful tree out in the middle of nowhere. It's like gray fog, a beautiful oak tree. My uncle, who had died in 2011, the year prior to this, or just a few months after prior to this, um, major influence in my life. I'm not so sure how much good or bad he was, but I think he took me to the beer store when I was three years old. <laughs> I loved the man dearly. Um, and, uh, um, he, he was there. And he was sitting on the ground. Um, anything I know about hunting or fishing, he taught me. And I wasn't a very good student. Because I really suck at both of them. But you were a pretty good student by the time you got to my class. <laughs> Trust me, your writing was above average. <laughs> he, uh, he, I thought I remember thinking, oh, he's like Rick Van Winkle, he's just sleeping. And I was trying to get his attention, like, oh Greg, I'm Greg, hey, hey, hey. Wasn't looking at me. Didn't even he was not plus that I was even around. Mm -hmm. So I'm acting like a chimpanzee, jumping up and down, trying to get his attention. These two figures come out from around the tree, were kind of like out of the mist, fall or whatever you want to call it. And one of them was my grandmother, and she had died in 2008. I've got my ears right. Um, and I, I, I call this guy my grandfather. He was he's my cousin. My uncle's child, his children, it's his dad. Um, I called him Paul Paul. Uh, thought the world of him, you know, because he loved to fish. We always talked about going property fishing together. So uh, when you saw them, were they younger than looking nope. or about, about the same? Exactly the same as I last remember. Oh. Um, Paul looked like George Jones to me. He had the same haircut. Uh, was just he was a heck of a big, uh, and uh, um, he was the one that did the talking. And when I say talking, really, I don't know if it was talking. Is it telepathic? I think so. Kind of right? conveying message to you. But it would be, it was a two-way street. I could convey what I wanted to say. My grandmother, however, would not look at me. Her, her, she would even look, and she just would not look at me. It bothered me, and I knew why. Uh, this part of that I was avoiding, but uh, there's some things that happened over there that I just, I'm not even going. to talked about the camera, but um, she was ashamed of me. And I was ashamed of myself, but um, it, it, I mean, when I say it, I don't want to get thrown out. I didn't do anything criminal, anything, nothing I'm worried about getting arrested. It was more of a, a morality thing. Um, there, there just comes a point when you got to say this is not right. You know, and I've gone past that point. Yeah. Right? And, uh, that's when I knew that everything that I was doing was just pretty much not the right thing to do. She felt like you disappointed her and that was Oh great. yeah, she did. I, she, my grandmother loved me. I, just for the record, I was her favorite grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like, she loved all of us. She really did. Uh, but I was the first, right? I was her first grandchild. And, uh, she, she would not look at me. And I knew why. But, uh, Paul, however, never had a problem telling people straight that uh, he was doing the talking. And uh, I'm like, I knew, I'm like, I guess I'm, down, I'm dead or dying or something. And he goes, yeah. And I said, I, or I said something like, Paul, what are you doing here? You know, you're not going to, because I died a few days ago or something like that. I can't remember exactly what I said. It's in my paper, though. I, I, I meant to really look over that because I, I, I yeah, and that's, I put it pretty, Parts that I could remember. Now, there was a lot of things that didn't come back to me from years later. Well, but that's a beautiful part because you had been in the coma for how many, or you've been in the hospital? I've been, I've probably been in the hospital at least 20 days at that 20, point. And he died during that time. And so I, this, is, this is kind of a verifiable fact, I mean, in some ways, because you didn't know that he had died and there he is, you know, really in a way to greet you. I mean, I, his papa was not somebody I called on the phone, he was just somebody I saw when I came home. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Uh, so he's there and he's communicating with you and what what more did he say? Um, and I, I just think it's strange that he was the one that did this. I mean, it, my, my, my grandmother's husband, 
I mean, that band was a major influence on my life as well. They, I, they were both, uh, they were a lot alike, but totally different men. Paul Paul was a, he probably raised a lot of hell in his younger days, and, and my other grandfather was, uh, you know, very straight left Pentecostal Christian. Uh, I'm sure, I, I, I got a feeling he might have done some things too, but, you know, he was, he was the rock of the family, uh, next to my grandmother, Paul, Paul Pete. Oh man, he was, he was all, he was just a guy you looked up to, you know what I mean? And, uh, I mean, He's so, the kind of guy you want to go drink beer with. Did it hurt you when he told you what he told you? Or no, no, no. You just no he, just, he, just, he was a straight shooter. He, yeah. I've never known him not to be. And maybe that's why he he was the one that did this because anybody else, I don't think, probably would have done it like he did. Um, and what did he say? So we established the fact that we were both dead. Or at least he was dead and I was dying. And uh, the next step was judgment. So I thought, all right. Won't be the first time I've been judged. I can get through it. My precise words, I can bullshit my way through it. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't be talking like this, but no, no, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, I want authentic. <laughs> this is my authentic interview. I can bullshit my way through it. I'm going to the front of the man, and I'm thinking I can bullshit through it. Yeah, it's just like I thought I could argue with God about my mission. Yeah. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. How about, how about we do this? And so, he said, <laughs> you're not going to make it. I said, I said, look, I'm in a lot of pain. I said, at this point, I don't even care. He goes, and this, uh, so I was speaking, uh, you know, uh, so he goes, he, he told me, he said, son, and, and sometimes when he was serious, he called everybody son. Or at least, I, I think my cousins will, will back that back there. When he, when he was serious, he would say something like son, or um, he said, son, you're not, you're not going to, you're going to go to hell. And, I still remember thinking, oh man, I'll chance it because the pain, I, I can't, the pain was just incredible. And um, he touched my shoulder and boom, I was back in my body and that effeminate little doctor was staring over me and he was slapping my face or or had my face like this. I'm like, Mr. John, Mr. John, you're back. And tears, <laughs> these crocodile tears, I know what you know, they were running down his face. Wow, so he was slapping your face? Yeah, I don't think he was slapping my face, but he, I, I, somebody was shaking me. I don't know, it was, so, All I remember is that I was looking, looking down. I was in this other world, and the next thing I know, I'm looking back up at this kind of chubby, cherubic-looking doctor that that had crocodiles here in front of us. And what's what is different about your near-death experience is you didn't actually experience hell or heaven. So you didn't actually. I mean, like it was kind of like that holding place where you meet ancestors, which is kind of a heavenly landscape in some ways, but it's that. I mean, I felt heaven as in when I was nearing the love and presence of God. To me, that was like, oh, so they, and then people like Howard Storm have described a horrific, you know, version of hell that is, you know, I had the instinct of Christ in that horrific, that horrific um, description that Howard gave. Uh, that one was behind corner or curtain A. And then the love and the peace was behind curtain B or vice versa. There were definitely two different ways you could go at this point. I, I mean, that was beyond, I, I did not argue that because I knew. I mean, I knew that, they, that I, listen. I, do you think it's people just don't choose God? And they choose, and, or do you feel like, I mean, you're saying to some degree, like there's some form of judgment that was, you just weren't going to pass. That's what was told to me. That's why. I'm, I, I told you earlier that I'm kind of envious of all the people that have had these beautiful experiences. Mine was not beautiful. Mine was not, mine scared the crap out of me. And I like to think that we're given what we need to come back to our lives and then be better. You know, like, I really needed that love to feel it. You know, like, to feel like, okay, it's possible to be loved like that. And a lot of people, a lot of near-death experiencers do have that. There are like 15 to 20 percent of them that are hellish, like you know what Howard describes, you know, like horror, and then they come back. That was terrible. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't listen to it all. Honestly, I mean, yeah. I'm a, I, my ears have heard lots of bad things. Howard's. So that you know, like, but 10 to 15 percent think of near-death experiencers have that hellish experience, but. But it's like, do you think you needed just like a warning to start living differently? Do you think Absolutely. that's what you Absolutely. needed? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I needed, a, I needed a wake up call. That's what I got. Yeah. Um, and I, did that 
did it make you happy though that we do go on and that there is this possibility? Of, I mean, because that's what most of your uh, experiencers feel too. I've always like, had an idea that there there were there was life after death, um, but you know when I told you I was jealous of people see, I smelled the smoke. Other people saw the light. You know, you talk about that. <laughs> and, and it's more of that for me than it was the other way. And um, that's when I realized that things I, I've got to change the way I look at, at life. And I've got to change the way I treat other people. And I, I think people that know me will, will say that maybe I came back and become a little bit kinder, a little bit more gentle. Um, there was a lot of PTSD, not from necessarily from the war. Um, you know, just getting out of the hospital was a, a beginning of a, of a journey in and of itself. It was not over with, by all means, when I came to the hospital door, or in front of the door of my house. Um, and that causes PTSD, I know. Like, you just kind of wonder if you're going to die again. You wonder if your body's yeah, healing. Yeah, because I was like, if I die again, I haven't had a chance to even correct what I needed to correct. That was the main thing. The doctor mm -hmm. called them. I, uh, this is a couple of weeks into it, after I've been home, um, and looked for those messages that the doctor needs to see. And that's just after I, like, I'm literally, my wife had, had set up doctor appointments for the next day after I got home, or the day, or the next business day. And, uh, that anyway, the doctor called and said, Got your test back, so I'm to see. I had to take this annex so I was just, just freaked out. I'm like, Oh my god, there's something majorly wrong because I knew I'd been sick and, and I knew there was something wrong with my lungs at this point. My lungs did not feel right, they just, they just did. Yeah. Uh, so, one of the miraculous things, uh, despite all the surgeries that I've had, you know, I lost part of my thumb to the gangrene. Had the tracheotomy, and some wounded right on the side, uh, where the, the evidently there had been a tube stuck into me, and nobody sanitized it. They just stuck it in me. I, um, got a weird casket. There's something inside of it. Nobody knows what it is. No. Yeah, I've, I've asked several doctors. I'm like, it, it looks like metal, but it's not. I, I mean, anyway, he saw this little speck of something in me, and uh, so it's got to be a tube or something, right? Um, it was the beginning of a lot of a lot of surgeries. I had to, uh, remember I told you about that, that blast uh, in Iraq, uh, kind of messed up my eyes a little bit and I didn't say anything to anybody because I didn't want to go home. I lost a lot of hearing. Uh, it got worse in Afghanistan. And then I think some of the medicines that they put into you while you're in a coma affect your hearing and affect your body. Uh, and I mean, I remember my skin being really sensitive, really red. They were flushing me full of, I got some bacteria. And they didn't know what it was. The doctor, I think, my family, we haven't really, I remember we had talked about it, I just forgot, but um, I went through microbiology, right? so I've got a very layman's understanding of, of gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria and what drugs used. They were throwing the book at me. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they were treating me for both gram-negative and gram-positive. That means they had no clues what I what was wrong with me. And uh, so mm -hmm. I went from being near death and I wish I could put a date on what day that happened. I, I can't. Um, it doesn't say anything in my hospital room. So can we flash back to that moment where you're with sure. the, the new doctor and, and you live? And what I found amazing about your story was how quickly you recovered after yeah. the near death experience and got out of so, the hospital. So within that time frame, how quick was it before you were on a plane back to the States? Around a week. A week. And so there was a ton of stuff that was wrong with your body. And, and you were fighting, I'm sure. So I went from having, uh, went from having, like, I think, well, I remember when I came out, my, my lungs were getting 88% oxygen. I don't know if you've ever been on 88% oxygen, but you can't function at that level. Um, I mean, you think 80, that's a good number, right? It's not. <laughs> it's, it's very bad. Uh, so uh, I remember, like. Did you have one of those machines? I had one of those machines that you had to blow in and make the, <laughs> the little thing go up. <laughs> I hated it. So. Have you ever seen the movie Office Space where they break the. Yes. <laughs> after, after, I did, after I did, I'm pretty good small and broke it. I smashed on it. And, um, I hated those little balls. Oh, uh, so you could only go up a little bit. I'm like, go yeah. away. <laughs> Um, uh, I had a party the day I got rid of that. Um, but yeah, I recovered amazingly fast. Uh, 
think uh, um, maybe that's led me to believe that that happened for a reason. Like it gave you the will to like I've got to change so much I've got to heal and then I, I think I was divine. being listen I'm a little bit Old Testament uh, I think I was being punished for some of the things that happened uh, I, I was getting pretty out there and I know probably some of my bosses are gonna watch this and, and there's things that that we did out there that they don't even know about you we were just we were out there in southern Afghanistan we left alone yeah and that's where, yes, different near-death experiences do lead to different conclusions because I felt, I felt like as I neared the light of God that God was just, he kind of threw all those things out as long as I didn't harm anyone. So it was like, if I was harming myself, God just was like, hey, that's just darkness. That's not love. That's not There was light. a lot of darkness. You're and, right. And, and it was just kind of you know, pushed aside, like focus on the light, focus on loving people, focus on being, you know, this person who's connected to God and the light and doing good in this world. And that was my message. You know, is that, and that in some flipped way, I mean, that is kind of your message, you know, to live differently. Yeah, because I, I, for 10 years I've been, you know, we're over there bringing, you know, Christianity and capitalism to the Middle East. Maybe that's, I, I, I'm not one to uh, talk about policy or whatever. I really don't care anymore. Uh, but what I know is that I don't have a part in that anymore. And I, even though I, I even wanted to, I even went back thinking I was going to go back and make a whole bunch more money and get back on my feet because it was a really uh, financial, financially devastating for us. And uh, I went back over there and left. I mean, I've got the tenure. I mean, I'm, I can live over there. I've lived over there for a decade. I stayed two months and I'm like, man, dude, I, yeah, it's not, this is not where I'm leaving. And maybe uh -huh. that's the near death experience too, because you have a greater sensitivity. I found that people after a near death experience have you found like that you're a little bit more sensitive to environments and people. Absolutely. I'm talking about like kind of H D intuition now. Yeah. Um, when you and I like I cannot I don't see the future and I don't I have no psychic ability, but um, there's just like the some things you know. Yeah. Or you get the feeling, and it's stronger than a feeling. It's very hard to put to words. And I know half of the song, you know, just like we've lost our lives, but it's it's a very real feeling, um, and so, it's never been never been wrong yet. So is it like a gut feeling about this is going to happen? Yeah. So that yeah. Kind of thing. But it's more than a gut feeling. It's like don't worry about it. This is yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah, so like where it's faded almost. Like some, I believe that we have free will and we choose a lot of things, but some things are just they seem. Destiny, right. Sense. And right. I, I'm a firm believer in destiny, and I also believe we can influence our destiny by our actions, yeah, positively or negatively. Um, and I, I wish that I came back from this being to be able to be perfect and like always make the I, I still louder and I still search for, for some of the meaning of why I'm back and what the heck I'm supposed to be. I mean, I enrolled in college immediately, and I'm, that's five years ago, and I'm still in junior college, but hey, I'm taking two classes at a time, you know, I've never quit. Yeah. Uh, except okay. when I had medical issues. But. And it is great that you ended up in my class. Like, I wasn't going to teach I wish that class. Tell, yeah, that, that <laughs> part is awesome. Story. I wasn't going to teach that class, and then someone got, or their mom got sick, the professor who was going to teach it, and so I took over that class. It was like, a, was it an evening class? Yeah, it was a, it was a morning break. I'm not a morning break. Yeah, me neither. I usually don't take work <laughs> classes or teach them. So I remember showing up, like, why did I take a morning class? Yeah. Oh, because right my professor said this professor was very easy. Um, and then now, so I saw your name on the wall. I'm like, wait, this is not good. Like, I'm with my professor. And I'm like, oh my God. She <laughs> likes to write. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, and, but it worked out, right? So the first, uh, the first paper I ever wrote in college was about my near death experience. Isn't that amazing? To a professor that had a near death experience. How about that? I know, and well, there's a little synchronicity for me too, because the very first class that I ever taught student teaching in Austin, I had a student who had been in a coma for a year, he had a brain injury, and he was 19 as a junior, and he was coming back to school, and I felt compelled to tell my near-death experience story, and he was like, I'm a total soul, and he's like, but can I write about it, and so he wrote in his journal that whole year, and he, he, he looked a little bit like you too, it was funny, and then we became like really bonded because he shared his near-death experience through this journal and I helped him you know talk about it and unpack it and he hadn't told anyone he hadn't told his parents he hadn't and you know it was a really you know well he, I know you know just this kid and then you know I think that was early on you know when I was teaching at this campus I was like 
There's only been, I think, two students at this campus who've told me about a near death experience. You're one of them. I found that when I came out of it, I couldn't shut up about it. And I think it's because my cognitive ability was somewhat diminished. Um, it was, it wasn't like I had to learn how to say my ABCs again, but I definitely had some retardation as far as my faculties. You know, I, 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 it was hard for me to like make change and hard for me to, mm -hmm. um, then eventually I came back, but yeah, basically I, I, I had to get back up to speed again, right? So you were just telling people I died? And... Yeah, matter of fact, I, I said something to a nurse one time. I was doing a, a drug test for a job. For the admin. That had been my life. I had never really worked anything other than the military in that job. Um, I saw him back home working like at a temp agency, right? I had to take a drug test and like, yeah, I died once. And I said, I'm going to in the nursing school, though. I'm going to be a nurse. And uh, which I finished all my career as a nurse, but I came here and I said, people, I, my, my lungs are just, I, I get pneumonia every, every six months or so. Uh, that's going away since uh, a lot of the drugs that I were like, oh, was prescribed, uh, they, uh, they led to, you know, they suppressed your immune system, you know. And uh, so, Got away from the nursing thing, and besides the comment, I'm really not empathetic enough yet to, to deal with sick people because it takes a very special person to do that. Yeah. Not me. I wish it was. I wish I was that good of a person, but I'm just, I'm like, parts me like, look, I know what I went through. You have to suck it up. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you can't do that, right? And then the worst, I worked in a hospital actually as a orderly, and uh, my best, well, one of my best friends is just uh, got a master's degree in nursing, and he's like, I've seen him in action. He's awesome, right? He's just this guy. Is, if you ever get sick or hurt, this guy gonna take care of you, right? But now he manages the whole nursing team. And, I mean, he's just—it's like he's born for it, right? Um, when people would come out of a out of a code or something, because my job was calling some of the codes, and uh, like they would come out and, and like there was this one guy in particular. He looked at me, and I looked at him. Something went between us. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know exactly what you just. Went through, dude, but you can't go up and talk to him about it, right? And then the mm -hmm. urge to talk to him, I'm like, okay, I only make 12 bucks an hour. It's not that big of a deal. I'll go talk to this guy. It's worth it. I'll get fired, but I don't care. Right. Uh, but I didn't do it. And I, I kind of I kind of regret that, actually. I'm not going to talk to him, but I know what he spelled and spoke to. So you're in that moment, because you had a near death experience, you realized he just had one. Yes. And what is so interesting about that, I don't know if you've come across this yet, but I didn't read too much about near-death experiences afterwards, and there weren't all these videos when mine came out, but I knew that because I crossed the veil, that weird things were going to happen. So if I could look in someone's eyes and then know when they were near death. So, you know, like one, one person I, I came across was older, but I just got the sense that he had cancer, and then two months later, someone was like, yeah, he had fast brain cancer, he's dead. Wow. You know, and that there were just little moments. I saw my grandmother right before I went to Korea, and I knew the light was coming for her. I just saw it in her eyes, and I knew that would be the last time I saw her. And, you know, there, there are always, there's just a knowing, I think, you know, that a lot of us have, and it's it's hard to put into words. Uh, and I know, well, we have talked about here, but I know, I know a lot about you, a bit about some of the things that, that you've seen. Uh, so that's quite intimidating, and I don't think I'm as nearly as a team with it. And that's what I'm very envious, and I know we shouldn't be envious, but I'm very envious. <laughs> Of, of people like you and how it's when others that I've, I've watched on your channel, um, I feel like I'm still like, um, not, what's the word? I'm still I'm new at this. Well, it's, Maybe, yeah, you, know. you are. It's only, you know, a few years, you know, Howard and a lot of these people and me, I didn't even start writing about it until 20 years after the fact. Yeah, so I, even when, when it's, you talked to me once about it, put me in touch with Jan. Yeah. And it was like, you didn't want to talk about it. That, well, I mean, it's not that you didn't want to talk about it. You just weren't, it wasn't a, I think you'd moved on at that point from it. And yeah. it was still raw and new to me. Yeah. But it was, you maybe you'd been jaded a little bit. And it wasn't that big of a deal to me. And, or at least that's the impression I got. And it was yeah, probably overworked. <laughs> could have been. Yeah, yeah could have been. But it, well, it was the summer. So yeah. it was summer semester. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think I put you in touch with Jan, hoping that you'd meet other people who have had experiences like you, because I got that from Jan's group. You know, I met other near-death experiences. Yeah, and I did think Jan. I thought Jan thought I was full of it, and maybe I don't know why I got that. She's certainly a sweet lady, yeah. and very. Jan's got it together. I, I wish I was like Jan sometimes, but 
how can she look at this objectively? Maybe because she's never had one or, or it just. I think people who research it and study it are definitely um, having to have a broad perspective of you know, all these different experiences and just coming out of it. Like you still have a lot to process. Like you still have like the long term, and it yeah. it meant different things to me at different times. Like opening this campus, my near death experience wasn't as important. I would tell it to students or you know engage with them, but like their success and their growth was like my whole focus. You know, it was like I came back with this particular mission. Like I want you and everyone to be successful. You know, and to be happy and fulfilled. And any little piece that I can add to that even if it's just a little bit of peace is important. You know, like that's that's kind of my mission. And then a couple of years ago, I heard this mission or like I heard God speak to me here in this campus and God was like, you're done. You, and I was like, what do you mean? Am I gonna die? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and God was like, your mission is done. You can do whatever you want. And I was like, I don't know how to do anything well, else. It's like a, there's a difference now. I, and mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a negative or positive way. It's just, it's like you were very engaged in it. I watched you probably over work, but I was like, I, like, well, I don't know about it. I wanted to ask, there were so, trust me, there were so many questions I wanted to ask. And, and, and you know, but each one is, it, nobody knows about my ND other than, or ND other than me. And it's not like you can sit there and interpret what I, you know, I'm going like, what does this mean? What did that mean? Yeah, but I'm glad you contacted me later. I mean, it's weird. You well, saw I, I saw your videos because, <laughs> I mean, there's still a lot of questions that I have. Like, I mean, why, why is it not in any hospital records that, that my heart stopped. Actually, you know, for, for the time that I was in the hospital, there's like five pages of records. That's it. Wow. For, for 45 days. Wow. So some things are missing. Yeah, there's a lot missing. There's a lot missing. Um, wow. So I'm sure it's in there somewhere. And I'm honestly, I, I don't need a piece of paper to tell me it happened. Yeah. But I'd like to know when. I know. Um, like it satisfies our own curiosity. I yeah, think. And like, and like, there was, listen, people, people talk about all you said this name. Let me, let me tell you this for the record. Uh, when, when you're in a coma, they give you drugs or, that will make you hallucinate. And, and I later heard that there's, they, they need to give it in a certain order. And if they don't, the hallucinations would be even more, more intense, right? Well, there, they were, there were some hallucinations, let me tell you. Uh, great hallucinations. I mean, I, I, I dreamed that I escaped from the hospital, jumped in the wheel well of a, a 777, flew to Canada. <laughs> And it was in Toronto, but I was in my hospital gown. I didn't have a passport, so I had to call my dad. Because that's my standard answer. I, I mean, whenever I got in trouble, I called my dad. And, um, so you had like, they bring me some clothes on my passport. What was the difference between that hallucination and the near death experience? Like, for people who haven't had one, like, can you clarify? Oh, absolutely. That? You come out of the hallucination, it's like, well, that was either scary or that was real funny. Yeah. That one was a funny one. You know, it's like, that was, that was a party. That was just nuts, you know. Um, and, uh, the uh, the near death experience was man, it's, it's on a it's on a level um, that that supersedes hallucinations. And the hallucinations were vivid, and, and as soon as they were over, you knew it was a hallucination, right? Not so with NDE, you know. Um, very very strange. The NDE changes you forever. I think that's what most researchers like Jan and. And um, others who have researched near death experience, whether it's hellish, whether it's you know just this moment like you experience, whether it's heavenly, whether it's profound, or just a moment out of body, you're changed because one, you know that there's an afterlife, you know that you relive part of your life, you see how you did, and most people experience that judgment as a life review. I don't think you know you didn't go through that, but but you know you come back and you're like I don't want to have that next life review, that final life review, right. and hate everything. Well, I want it to be different. Different, absolutely. And like when I've heard it, and everybody talks about this life review, like I want help. There's a movie about it. I, I even watched a movie that was like made in the 80s or the early 90s after the NDE. Can't remember the name of it, but I think it was Meryl Streep. Um, and they did a life review, and they like had past lives and all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I didn't have any of that. Mom was I'm like, I feel kind of cheated. You know, and, and uh, mine was like, dude, this is not the way you're going to live. Uh, and if you, if you continue to do so, or it's not the way you need to live, but if you continue to do so, um, then you're going to pay the price. Would well, you think that you went back to watching videos of your death experiences, maybe to glean some information from how others live their life? Like what I got from God, you know, like the message, you know, that I believe this is beyond religion, beyond everything. 
else is like love is all that matters you know like that's if you can center that in your life give love to people then you're doing part of what god wants you to do it is like to just spread love and that seems so simple you know but that can be with a child a coworker, or you know any moment, you know, like love is the healing force. I'm definitely better with strangers and more empathetic with strangers. I'm, I'm terrible with my own family. Um, me and my wife and my children, I, I got better saints because they have to live with me. I'm, I'm very demanding and, and I'm hard to live with. Um, my my parent, my relationship with my parents is better than it has ever been. Uh, it, it used to not be so great because I was a snot. You know, I was terrible. And, uh, well, we don't come back as perfect, that's that's for sure. And I think... Well, it'd be a lot easier if we could. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, if I go through that, it's, it's, give me some tools to make it better, right? Don't just send me back and say, hey, you're on your own again. Well, that's part of it, you know? It's free will. And when I... The re you asked about why I started... If, I wouldn't say I was searching for answers, but yeah, I'm searching for answers because, okay, I, I, I had this miraculous recovery. Any doctor that looks at my files will tell you that this guy shouldn't be alive. This guy uh, is a walking miracle. I've seen so many doctors that would read my medical report, what little of it there is, and tear up like, I don't know how you survive. Uh, I had something, I developed something that was called ARDS, and very few people survive. Something like Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson is a very, I don't love Stonewall Jackson. His, his maximum is online, for, which he stole from somebody else, but it's pretty good. Um, anyway, he died from the same thing. It's basically, you know, you get sick or you get traumatized and you get pneumonia and you die. A lot of people die from it back then. Uh, still, a, still a thing, you know, it happens a lot to war people, uh, people on war veterans. Uh, but, well, to go back to why, I know I, I just digressed a bit, but why, uh, why I started watching videos or why would I Google NDE? <sighs> we talked about this a little bit. <sighs> there, I feel like I'm not lost, but I feel like I'm not doing what I'm, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm trying to find some sort of, I don't feel like I'm on the path that I need to be on. Um, That's very common. Like, it's it's not uncommon, like a lot of near-death experiencers. I was given this direct mission to come back and teach, and I'm glad yeah. I was. But a lot of people were just sent back and were like, okay, I know I have to be better, do good in some way, but how? And so you're in this culture, and pretty much everything in our culture tells us to just make a lot of money, you know, like do things that really are not consistent with just loving other people. Right. I, I would like to focus on uh, being a social worker, and I would like to focus on helping veterans that have PTSD. My wife taught me an awful lot about how to, by example, not not like some sort of textbook advice, but let her example of being patient and. and some turning the other cheek and sometimes just shutting your mouth and listening. It's very hard for me to do. Uh, uh, but what I find with veterans, especially guys that have been where I've been, uh, I'm very understanding. And we, we share a connection. And, and they will usually open up to me faster than they will to the team. For some reason, I've kind of been the sounding board. And I'm, I'm not bragging about this, but we all stay in touch, right? And um, we all call each other with our problems. Yeah. But we don't tell these are problems we would never tell anybody else. And that's so valuable to be able to do that to our people. So I would like to focus on that. But you know, a social worker makes 12, 15 bucks an hour. I can't live in Keller, Texas with that kind of money. With kids, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you do? So what do you do? So I thought I'm trying to figure it out, right? I've got a pretty good job. And I, I don't, I, by any means, feel like I'm satisfying the world's need for loving and good people by doing it, you know, it's just a job. You know, I, I, I had a summer class with you, but in my other classes, we did service learning and we went out to different organizations and donated some of our time, you know, outside of class and then students wrote about it and that was part of their grade. And it was amazing, like students got the joy, like with them, you know, they were, yeah. even if their lives were messed, they were like, oh wow, I really helped this kid learn how to, you know, do this school assignment, a little, you know, young kid or, you know, like giving back gives us joy. And that's what I found through teaching is through all those years. Like it was a joy. Like it was truly a joy. I got out of my mind, my my world, and you know, was interacting with other people. And so 
volunteering, even if it's through church or you know one trip or something like that. I think it always it gets us out, and then that peace that you're looking for. You mentioned it before, but like meditation is amazing. You know, like just getting into that space or even just praying deeply every I day. Fun. I need to find some meditation guru, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. I, I'm not one that can do that. I'll have to be guided in shutting down. Because I'll, I'll just, send you some links. I'm like fast forward all the time. Um, the um, the service field of life um, is also a purpose field of life. Have you ever read that book? Um, yeah, I have. It, 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 it's like, well, I have wasted my life. That's a big thing with me. I know I haven't wasted it, but yet I have. I know. I've not lived it full, even though I've had great, crazy, uh, uh, probably experiences that got me the near death experience. <laughs> but um, I, I, have to, all, I have to step in. It's like our country, you know, like when they send people out to war, I finally understand, you know, that, yeah. that moment where we're supposed to say thank you for your service because it is scary. I mean, like, my, my is country dangerous. didn't send me to war. Like, it was like, hey, we're going to pay you this much to do this. The contract, yes, I know. But you were in the military first. Yeah. And, you know, like there is, I think, a debt of gratitude that people have for people who risk themselves in that way. You know, like there is, you know, that if there is an honor in just saying, you know, thank you for you know, what you've done. And that is, it's a, it's tough. We, uh, well, it's funny, I've got a buddy named Reese, and he has never been in the military. He's one of us. They basically got kidnapped. In Afghanistan, the guy was in. Wow. He's he's, uh, he's uh, forced into himself. He's um, I, I would go into combat with that guy any day over a Navy SEAL, Green Beret. It, it's uh, he's just it's just one of us, you know. Um, when I, I know the world needs guys, guys like like that, and um, guys that are willing to do. Risk their lives and, and, and risk risk harm, but at the end of the day, it was like four paycheck as well. Um, you get a little bit patriotic sometimes. Um, it, it, it wasn't so much we were waving the flag as we were balancing the checkbook, and that's that's the hard, cold fact of it. But I'll tell you, any day I've seen some wonderful places in this world, and but I'm still happy to come home to America every day, especially Texas. But um, yeah, there, there's, I mean, my favorite color is freedom, but that, I mean, I like having freedom in Afghanistan. I like having freedom. I mean, everybody should have it, right? And, and what pisses me off, man, is when people are oppressed. And that's when my inner, uh, inner demon can come out when, when somebody is oppressing somebody else. And when I saw that over there, I would just leave my mind sometimes. Um, I did not, I did not like seeing other people not being able to express themselves or not being, you know, it was just bad. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I saw a tiny bit of it in South Korea, you know, like women were second class citizens. And so, you know, I would see a guy beating a woman publicly, and sometimes Canadians and Americans couldn't handle it. Teachers and like, Canadians not people too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. but like girls one time got involved, and we grabbed this guy yeah. off a, a woman who was beating her up. <laughs> and it, but, but you know, like military people are told not to get involved in these situations, so we heard it from them, from the military guys in, in South Korea, not to involve themselves. And well, there was this one time, and we, you know, you have to be, you don't have to be respectful of somebody else's culture when you're over there with a bigger gun than what they have, but you have to, you have to be aware of it, and you have to understand the consequences and repercussions of, of acting outside that culture. Um, my my mother-in-law, man, this woman can send the best care packages you could ever imagine. Right? My mom did too, but my my mother-in-law always sent candy, and I, I told you I had a sweet tooth, right? Um, well, she sent too much. Of it. God bless her, I love her. She she just sent me way too much. I, even as much as I loved it, I couldn't eat it all. So what I did, I kept it in my truck with me, and as I would see an Afghan on guard duty and some of these truck guards I would go to or a checkpoint, I would hand them another butter. Or a coat that saved my life one time. Doing that, I did. Um, I, I pulled up into this what we call a Kandahar truck yard, and it was a, probably one of the most dangerous places on earth. And then all the trucks were coming in from Kandahar and then the surrounding area, and you don't know what they have on. So we were running through an extra machine and running through the. I cannot tell you how many bombs went off. I lost count. Oh. Luckily, I don't know of any of them that were killed. Um, but it was just one of those. Hunger moments, you know, and uh, I was coming out of there one time, 
but pre previously I had pulled in there and they were treated by Afghan guards. They're like second class citizens. They had hot water, like we're at 120 degree heat, right? 110 degrees. Um, they were in a, a tent, no AC, sitting on the ground with some just hot water. I said, this is, this is pretty inhumane. So I brought them, uh, I asked my boss if I could buy some, some sodas and some Snickers bars from the PDX and take it to him. He said, sure, do what you can. Well, that went a long way further than I do at that point. Uh, a couple of months later, I was coming out of there and I got ambushed. And I mean, I did it was like, this is it, I'm dead. And uh, I threw a, 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 threw a, uh, a distraction device and I think it almost took off one of them's leg. It was pretty bad. And that pissed them off even more. And I, I got the car turned around to where I had the, the mild passenger or over there, the, the, the driver's side is on the opposite side. So I just kind of nosed it into a ditch and got out. And I got my weapons and, and I was getting ready to, to just sell it all right there. And, and these guys came rushing out of this, this compound. And I uh, heard an RPK, which is machine gun, it opened up. And these guys whoop, scattered. Right. <laughs> And I uh, uh, got it on a video, some of uh, the aftermath, the, the commander, we were, I went back a couple days later to tell them thank you, you know, they, they saved my life. It was a, it was probably one of the most terrorizing moments that I, I was terrorized. I, it was actually, I shut down for a second. It, it happened so fast and scared me so bad, I froze up. And I'm not supposed to freeze up, I'm supposed to know what to do. And, and then, I mean, it happened so fast, and I froze up and I was like, if I do not wake up, I'm about to die. And so I, I got into action. And, and, and uh, a couple of days later, I'm back. And uh, the commander's name was Marzai. And, uh, and he was making fun of me. He's like, oh, you had to change your drawers, huh, John? <laughs> but he's the one who gave the candy to you? Really? Yeah, he just hate him and his team. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. A wonderful act of kindness. Wonderful act of kindness. And I've got a yeah. picture. I can't put it on there anymore. Everybody ever saw it. I don't even know if the guy's still alive. Uh, but, oh. you know, and it, uh, turns out he, he had, they, they were, they'll, they'll dye their beards red, their hair red. And it's a sign of a holy man. He was one of them. And uh, uh, he, Saeed, and uh, Saeed, or Zai, and uh, he came running out, him and his team, Saeed. That's a great place to end because it is kind of a, a sweet note. So, and I think that, you know, the kindness that we give, sometimes we never get it back, you know, like in, in a That changed like, a lot. That, 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 changed, that, that okay. changed the way I looked at things. Yeah. Um, even though I didn't even look at, didn't realize it at the time, but that's, that was a good one. And for you and for those who have PTSD for any reasons, now we're learning so much more about it. Like, quiet time spent in nature and just letting things go is like just valid and just like creating peaceful happy moments with your family and by yourself yeah. and in this world i think that's the beginning step but also believe it or not calling on god and the angels to help you with that it's like i have really put a lot of my pain in the hands of a higher force and god you know what i'm handing it over to you and that has brought so much healing into my life I, i'm a firm believer in that I and mean, i'm always even though I wouldn't say I've always been a believer, my mom always, she drilled that to me. I turned it over to God. My grandfather did too. Um, and even though in the times where I didn't believe, I, I really did believe. Yeah. And then, like, with my pain and, and like, the serious physical pain I've had afterwards, God is, and it's just more than coincidence, right? Oh. God, God put you in my life. He put my friend Chris in my life. If I had with Chris, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I probably would have ended it. I was in so much pain after I came home. Um, and it's not, that's, that's, I guess that's a fault, but I mean, to those who have never been in that kind of pain, when, when you're facing that kind of reality day in and day out, and I don't think there's any shame in it, but I, I was just going to find a quiet, happy place and go into it because that was the, the level I was at. I mean, he stepped in at just the right minute. And um, I, 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 I just, a lot of people in my life that I, I owe a lot to, and I love dearly for it. And for those who are suffering too, like I do want to talk to you on the camera, I like, that is a physical pain is a huge issue and it brings a lot of depression to people's lives but keep searching because there is an answer there usually is an answer you know somewhere along the line and certainly believe it or not meditation and yoga and these things too can help ease a lot of that physical pain but thank you john yeah, for like, telling like churchill said never 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 give up yeah yeah never <laughs> even in those final moments when it is the end but Thank you for talking with me. It's really cool. And so I hope that this connects with people who 
have experiences like you or are curious about the military. And uh, they, they can reach out to me um, through you, I guess, through the yeah. easiest way. Um, and you know, if you have questions or whatever, yeah. ask. Um, thank you, and may you be blessed. And thank you, John.